to record the service. And here we go. We acknowledge with deep gratitude that we are on the territory of the Shuswap and Tanaha nations and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I invite us to have a moment to come to the moment, come to our senses, um, maybe be aware of whatever we are looking at, uh, bring our attention to that, bring our attention to whatever we're feeling, bring attention to our bodies, maybe bring attention to our, our breath and our breathing, And just come into the to the present moment, reminding ourselves that real life is not in our minds and in our thinking. Real life is in the moment, and uh, we can only truly be in the moment if we get out of our mind and our thoughts and into present. Always and everywhere in the present moment, there is the surface, what's happening on the surface. But underneath the surface, there's always stillness, presence, sacredness, and grace. Today, our topic is grace, which is uh, beautiful, transformative, and radical. A way to understand grace is it comes from the same root as the word gratis, which means free gift. When we get something gratis, it means it's free. Uh, it's on the house. <laughs> and grace is the free, unmerited love of God. If we're religious, or it is the graciousness of the universe that gives to us freely that God and the universe are gracious and we receive gift after gift. And when we live by grace, it's the, it's living by a power greater than ourselves and giftedness. It's the opposite of striving, struggling, efforting, earning, performing. And so the first hymn that I wanted us to sing and hear um, Carolyn and Greg sing and play is Just As I Am, which is a hymn that was used in many Billy Graham crusades and so on. But it, it does have a very um, important message that when we come to God, to life, we come just as I am. And often um, it's, there's a sense that the person singing it comes after heroic efforts to help themselves, to save themselves, to change themselves. And they come to the end of their resources and they're struggling and stressing and pushing and pulling and they are exhausted and can't do it by themselves. And then they come to the source of life, to the higher wisdom, to the uh, deeper intelligence that we call God. And uh, there's a sense of surrender that I just, need God to do for myself what I, for me, what I can't do for myself. And, and we don't come after becoming somebody that we think we should be. We just come as we are. And so I'd like to invite Carolyn and Greg to lead us in our first hymn, Just As I Am. Thank you. 
So uh, our words of wisdom today, um, thank you, Carolyn and Greg. Uh, so uh, on our theme, on our scripture and our theme for today, this is a devotional writing by Father Richard Rohr. Many of you will be familiar with Richard Rohr. This is what he writes. Paul's letter to the Romans and Galatians are a tour de force on the pure meaning of grace and the serious limitations of morality and religion to lead you to God. Cursed be the law, Paul even says. No wonder he has been called a moral anarchist by people who are still seeking any well-disguised path of self-realization. But it seems Christianity has paid little heed to Paul's revolutionary message, or even to Jesus who says six times in a row, the law says, but I say. Both Jesus and Paul knew that rules and requirements were just to get you seriously engaged with the need for grace and mercy. They were never an end in themselves. If you keep the law, the law will keep you, we students were told on the first day of the seminary. Uh, Father Richard Rohr is a Catholic priest. As earnest young men anxious to succeed, we replied, yes, Father. We knew how to survive in any closed system. I'm afraid we spend so much time in that world that it became the whole agenda. Canon law was quoted much more often to us than the Sermon on the Mount before the reforms of Vatican II. And now the young priests are being taught in much the same way as I was. A strong emphasis on law and order makes for a sane boarding school or an organized anything for that matter. I really get it, get that. It probably made it much easier for the professors to get a good night's sleep with 120 young men next door but it isn't anywhere close to the gospel. The gospel was not made to help organizations run smoothly. We come to God not by doing it right, but surprise of surprises, we come to God by doing it wrong. We are justified not by good works, but by faith in an infinite mercy that we call grace. It has nothing to do with past performance or future plans for an eternal nest egg. All it requires is a deep act of confidence in a loving God. It is so hard to believe that this imperfect, insignificant creature that I am could somehow bear the eternal mystery. God can only grow bigger as we grow smaller, as John the Baptist put it. If we try to grow bigger by any criteria except divine mercy itself, we only grow in love with our own image in a self-created mirror. That is normally called narcissism. How could God love me so unconditionally, we all ask. This was Paul's struggle as well, and it led him to his cataclysmic conclusion, God loved Paul in his unworthiness, while he was yet a sinner, as he puts it. Therefore, he did not have to waste the rest of his life trying to become worthy or prove his worthiness to himself or to others. We seem to think God will love us if we change. Paul clearly knows that God loves us so we, can, so we can change. The only people who change, who are transformed, are people who feel safe, who feel their dignity, and who feel loved. When you feel loved, when you feel safe, and when you know your dignity, you just keep growing. That's what loving people do for one another, offer safe relationships in which we can change. This kind of love is far from sentimental. It has real power. In general, you need a, judicial, a judicious combination of safety and necessary conflict to keep moving forward in life. Paul has fallen in love with a God who has loved him for nothing. For the rest of his life, Paul is happy to give God all the credit, and he stops trying to validate himself by any means whatsoever. This creates a very different kind of person, someone who is utterly free. To show how infinitely rich God is in grace, you are all saved by a total gift and not by anything you have done, so that nobody can ever claim the credit. You are God's work of art, to live the good life as God meant us to live it from the beginning. This is my summary translation of perhaps my favorite passage from the Pauline letters. That's what Richard Rohr is saying. Paul deeply accepted that he was saved while yet a sinner, as we all must eventually do. He knew he was saved by God's free choice, mercy, and election, 
God's infinite love has nothing to do with good works or deservedness. Paul was on his way to do more cruel and murderous things when Christ stopped him on the road to Damascus. God wanted to reveal his son to me, as Paul brilliantly puts it. The formerly outer God has become an inner identity for Paul, and even his deepest self-identity. It will be the same for you if you stay on the journey. This necessary breakthrough that Paul received and allowed moved him beyond his early reliance upon obedience to laws and requirements, mere ego achievements, for his self-validation. We all usually begin with law, but as Martin Luther saw in Paul's movement toward justification by faith alone, we must move there too. Luther himself grew into grace after trying so hard to be a good and perfect monk as I once did too. All people in religions at the early stages try to justify themselves by some form of performance and achievement, Lutherans, Catholics, and everyone in between. Sometimes that achievement is my heroic act of faith itself. All religion, if it matures, will move the soul from the performance principle, any form of meritocracy, to the pure realm of grace. But this always takes many years of growing, testing, and ever more practical trusting in God and many deep surrenders to grace. One emotional experience of giving your life to Jesus is a good but very small startup ex exercise. You have no idea what that means or what it will ask of you yet, just as a young couple has no idea what their sincerely stated marriage vows will eventually require of them. God mercifully doles out our life in doses. And that's the end of Richard Rohr's uh, commentary on what we're talking about today. Just some quotes then about grace. Grace is the free and unmerited favor of God. Grace can neither be bought, earned, or won by the creature. If it could be, it would cease to be grace. Grace is the voice that calls us to change and then gives us the power to pull it off. Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace, and your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. If I'm not showing grace, I have forgotten the grace I've been shown. All right. Time for our story. Oops, I'm going to go back and do that and open it up. Okay, hope you're all still with us and time for our story. Hey, friends. Hey, hey, I'm still with you. <laughs> I found something. I brought it for you. I think it's a piece of garbage. Piece of garbage? Is it? Um, No. Hi, Benny. Welcome. Hi. Good to see you this morning. That was outside on the yard. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, this is not garbage. This is money. What's money? Um, oh. I don't, I don't know. Well, money is what um, humans use to uh, pay for things. More information, maybe. What's pay for things? Oh, yeah. You're a bear. Yeah. I guess you don't pay for anything. Oh, so when we, almost everything in life, we have to pay for it. Like we have to oh. give money. Oh, yeah, almost everything. Like what? Um, well, food. Yeah. Um, we have to pay for our food, and we have to pay basically for anything we drink. We have to pay for oh. that. And uh, our clothing, we have to pay for our clothing, uh -huh. and we have to pay for like our homes and uh, where we live, like our shelters. Oh. Yeah, just pretty much wow. everything. Like, uh, don't you have, yeah, yeah, you're a bear. You don't. Wait, everything for me is sort of like free, I guess. Like, I don't pay for anything. No. I don't have clothes. I and I just get up in the morning and go eat dandelions. They're free. Yeah, lots of dandelions. They're free. Yeah. And I guess your everything's free for you. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's not really true for humans. Yeah, we huh. pay for almost everything. Huh. Yeah. Well, wow. yeah. Is yeah, I don't know. Is there anything that's free? Well, oh, that's a good question. Is there anything that's free for us? Well, Fortunately, air is still free. Huh. I mean, yeah, yeah. we don't have to pay to breathe. Like, <sighs> yeah. yeah, I mean, air is free. free and for me too. Um, beauty is free. Like if, you know, if you see something beautiful, like the mountains or, yeah, yeah you don't have to pay oh, for that. Oh, that's neat. Like, yeah, yeah, I just get my good looks for free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I get my good looks for free. Yeah, um, I wouldn't pay for that. 
<laughs> oh, that sounded bad. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, there's other things that are free. Um, like, uh, well, I mean, friendship, when you have uh, friends. I like guess. Ah, yeah. Yeah, that's free. Um, and, and, and love. Like, the only, lo like, love has to be free. There's no way you could ever pay anybody to love you. I mean, no. that's not love. Then no, love, I just love you for free. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love you. For yeah. Um, That's nice. So, yeah, though, I mean, so it's kind of, yeah, there's a lot of things we pay for, but we sure the best things we don't pay for. Like, you, you know, sorry to interrupt. No. It starts to explain things for me a bit. I watch people. Yeah. I'm a, a kind of uh, not a real voyeur, but I do watch people. And I've sort of thought it looks like people like they buy things well i didn't know you were buying them but you're getting a whole bunch of things trying to it almost seems like that's the way people feel like they're okay so they get bigger houses or sometimes they go buy big trucks and that's the way they try to feel okay about themselves and and what you, mm -hmm. i think it's like really you just be it's free what yeah. like we're that's beautiful Benny. Huh. Like just be being okay. That's free. It's free. And it's free for us bears. I'm okay. That's beautiful. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you wake up in the morning and you're okay. Yeah. And uh, during the day, you're okay. Yeah. And I'm loved and I love for free. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's beautiful. And that's kind of what we're talking about in church today is that God cool. loves us for free. Yeah. And we are okay. We're always okay for free. And we can yeah. never, we can never work for it or huh. buy it or be good for it, or, or like earn right. it. I mean, it's 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 just something we have to realize that who we are, um, we are. It's just who we are. We're we're okay. Yeah. And, and okay. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. <laughs> okay. We're we some people oh. would say we're copacetic. But you know, Benny, before you go, um, there's a word that we use for it and it's called grace. Uh -huh. When you live by grace, it means that you receive for free. It's a gift. Oh. And it's there's nothing you have to do to earn it or buy it or perform for it. It's just a given. And love so it. yeah. I love it. We're talking I'm about grace today. Thank you. I look forward to that. And I'll go breathe now. Bye. <laughs> Bye, baby. I'm going to take a breath myself. And... Hey, Fred, do you need that 20? Can I have it back? <laughs> Just lost that $20. All right. We're going to do something. I'm not sure what. Um, we are going to go back to our shared screen. Oh, there is Benny and Charlie. And we're going to oh have Carolyn and Greg sing God of the Sparrow. God of the earthquake, God of the storm, God of 
Beautiful. Thanks, Carolyn and Greg. Wendy is going to read our scripture today. Good morning, Wendy. How are you doing, Wendy? Uh, we can't hear you, Wendy. Maybe you're still muted. Wendy, I'm just going to start reading, and then when you when you jump in, uh, just interrupt me, okay? The first reading is Genesis 18, 1 to 15. When Paul tries to explain faith and how faith is what justifies people and not works, he uses the example of Abraham and Sarah who went on faith that God would use them, although they were very old, to birth a new people. It was not about Abraham and Sarah's effort or performance, but all about their trust in God's effort and performance. So this is the uh, Older Testament reading today. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre as he sat, sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? He said, and he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. Can you hear me now, Brent? Ah, oh, Wendy, hello. <laughs> I just had to change my microphone. I was on the wrong microphone. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. <laughs> well, good. You, you sounded very good. You did a very good job in reading. Thank you. The second reading are excerpts from Romans. In his letter to Rome, Paul argues that people no longer have to follow the Jewish customs of circumcision and other works of the law. That is not, he says, what makes people right with God nor what changes them into new creations. It is receiving the grace of God through faith. In the following verses, we hear a bit of what Paul writes about grace and faith. They, they are now justified by God's grace as, as a gift. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. But the, fr but the free gift is not like the trespass. 
For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of the man of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The third reading is Ephesians. Oh, the third reading <laughs> is Ephesians 2. This continues Paul's message on grace as different from works. But Paul, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in, G in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that, one, so that no one may boast. For what we are, what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. May we hear the sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. We figured it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, great topic today. I'm excited to talk to you about it. Uh, to begin with, can I just remind us all that Jesus was Jewish and all of his early, earliest follower, followers were Jewish. So, um, Paul was Jewish. Um, and of course, to be Jewish uh, then and now uh, was to have a certain customs, rituals, traditions, and laws that uh, the Jewish people did to, um, as part of their devotion to God, as their rightness with God, and also a form of uh, self-identity, you know, distinguishing them from, from, from non-Jewish people. And so there were laws and traditions and customs around everything from what to eat and how to eat it to what to dress, how to live, how to speak, how your week was going to go, what, how you would rest on a Sabbath day. And one particularly was circumcision. That was a sign of being Jewish is that men were circumcised. So this became uh, a big question and a stumbling block for converting people to the way of Jesus, following Jesus, if they had to become Jewish first. And not just Jewish, but follow these traditions, especially circumcision. I mean, it's one thing for a baby boy to be circumcised a few days old, but it's another thing for a grown man to get circumcised. And a grown man might say, nah, I think I'll pass on that. And so Paul um, particularly uh, argued that people who follow the way of Jesus no longer need to be Jewish. And this was a big deal in the early church. And, uh, and so Paul, uh, Paul had to argue it strongly. Uh, a lot of his letters in Romans and Galatians and so on uh, talk about it. And um, Paul argued that people are not justified and I, uh, by works of the law. They are justified by faith. Particularly, they are justified by grace, which is God's unmerited love. And they sort of know that through faith. We know that through faith, but it's really, it's just a free gift. And this was massively radical, what Paul was saying. 
not only did you not have to be Jewish, you didn't have to follow these laws, but it also began to challenge any kind of sense that there are rules and regulations um, and merit that we have to fulfill to be loved by God. Just say it's a gift. And all you need to do is accept it. And that was a big deal. As I said, the, the word grace comes from the same root as the word gratis, which we still use today. Something's gratis, it's on the house, it's free today, uh, you know, at a restaurant or whatever. And um, and so grace is, uh, it just means we're loved for free. And this is uh, a big deal. And um, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but you know, a, a little image that comes to my mind is, you know, in the last few weeks, we've watched looters go into stores during the riots and the protests. And uh, some of the images of these looters, you know, like the, the authorities aren't around and the store is open and they go in. But even as I watch them on TV, they seem to be knowing they're breaking the law and they're guilty and they, and that kind of stuff. And what if, what if the store owners um, just sort of opened up the store and stood at the door and said, come on in, everything is free. Today, tomorrow, and forever. And whatever you take, we're just going to keep replenishing the shelves. And uh, you don't need a Costco card. You don't need a, a Visa card. You don't need cash. Just come on in and help yourself. It would be like, what? That is crazy. Um, grace is actually very scandalous um, because we tend to live in a world where there is a thing called the system of requirements. There's other words for it, or performance principle that we are to perform. I just went through a performance appraisal at my previous job. I suppose I could end up going through a performance appraisal at my current job. But there's a system of requirements. There's a performance principle. Or there is um, measuring up is another word to put it, that we, we need to measure up. And then there's an interesting term called meritocracy, um, which is like the, the rule of merit. When we live under meritocracy, it's a whole system of merit. Um, and we do, um, we do have all this around us, and uh, it's um, it's part of life, you could say. And the idea that there's things that are free and just given to us can be radical and life-changing. First, I'd like to talk about what it's like for some people to live in a home, to grow up in a home where a home can be a place of grace, or it can be a place of works. And often that's not overt. It's not really that conscious, but some children sort of know that their childhood was one of grace, where they were loved for free. They didn't need to perform for it or anything. And, and other children sort of learned that they grew up in a home where there were conditions and love wasn't free. There's a great sort of way to put it is, um, I love you if, and as soon as you have an if, then it's not love, it's merit. I love you if you're like your sister. I love you if you grow up and be who I think you should be. I love you if you're, you always listen to me and do everything I tell you to do. Um, I love you if you're, um, just who I need you to be. Um, I love you if you're quiet. I love you if you're kind. I love you if you're a servant. I love you if you um, are good all the time. And uh, it's possible for people to uh, mostly unconsciously pick that message up that there's an if in my family. I'm more loved if I'm like this way. And so if I, if I, if I do that, then I'm, there's more love available. That's growing up in a home not of grace, but of a performance, of measuring up, of, of works. Uh, a home where there, there's criticism and judgment, and there's this constant criti criticalness 
that's not a home of grace. That's a home of of merit, of uh, works. And um, and the opposite of that, a home of grace is where, you know, th there's there's guidance. There's people can get mad. People can say, I don't like it when you do that. But that's never questioning whether a person's loved. Like it's just never on the table. And I was talking to somebody this week, and they were they were saying. Well, yeah, clearly, I mean, when you love your children, there's nothing your children can do that at the end of the day, or even during the day, that you don't love them. I mean, that's just never on the table. I mean, of course. And it's like, at the end of the day, you're my son and daughter. There's nothing you can do that you're not my son and daughter. I love you. I mean, and even if I'm mad that you took the car and didn't ask for it, it doesn't mean I don't love you. It's, that's not the issue. And somehow the kids know that, that, okay, you don't like my behavior right now, but I never really doubt whether you love me or not. Grace is a given. And it's not something I have to earn or perform for or measure up to. It's just like part of the air I breathe. I mean, it's, it's kind of there. That that's a, makes a profound difference on a person's orientation to life, whether you grow up in an environment of grace or works. Um, and then it, it can affect us as, as individuals of how we go through life because um, I almost want to say everybody tries to fix themselves and change themselves and conform themselves somehow to be okay in this world. And we all have our own ways of putting on masks and performing and playing roles and, and, and sort of smelling the environment and going, okay, who do people need me to be for people to like me right now? And, uh, and then we start doing things to ourselves. We start accepting certain parts of ourselves and rejecting other parts of ourselves. We, we start to push some things away and try and hold on to other things. Uh, we manipulate ourselves and we try to save ourselves and fix ourselves. And often before somebody would go in to see a counselor, they have spent years trying to fix themselves and manipulate themselves and do all kinds of things to themselves to be okay. And it's really radical news to hear that you, you got to quit doing any of that. You just need to be yourself. You need to quit trying to fix yourself and manipulate yourself, because every time you do, you just make yourself worse. The ego cannot get rid of the ego. The ego just reinforces more ego. So to let go and let God, to surrender, is crazy radical. It means like, I just, how do I trust the universe that if I quit doing anything to myself, not only am I okay, will I be okay, but actually I'll start to change in ways I never could have made happen on my own. And that's living by grace. It's like God can do for me what I can't do for myself. And it's a free gift. Um, so that's, that's huge. Another place that we see it is in church. I know a lot of people don't go to church and but, you know, I, I have this impression that with the way churches used to be is um, the main message was the reason to be a Christian was to go to heaven after we die. And there were requirements for that. Um, you had to be a Christian. You had to uh, believe that Jesus was your Lord and Savior. Um, maybe you had to, well, you had to sort of believe a certain set of beliefs. Maybe you had to pray a certain way or have the sacraments and be in good favor with the church. Um, no salvation outside of the institution it used to be a line. And all of these were requirements that the church puts in there. Um, we, we, we struggle with grace. We, we struggle that God loves us for free and it's a gift. There's got to be some kind of requirements. Like surely, well, and, and then we make it, okay, it's not works, it's faith. But you have to have faith. So faith becomes a new requirement. It's like the content changed, but the system of requirements is still in place. 
And you have to have a certain kind of faith and believe a certain kind of beliefs. And then grace just doesn't quite be grace anymore. It's not a gift. Um, Philip Yancey wrote a book a number of years ago called What's So Amazing About Grace? And, and I read it years ago and it made a big impact on my life. It, I loved it. And one of the reasons Philip Yancey says he wrote the book is he's an American. And in the United States, he said, interview or surveys of young people or people, when they were asked about what they thought of people who go to church, one of the last things they thought of is grace. I mean, or that they just thought of judgmental, critical people. They didn't think of gracious people. And he realized that somehow the Christian church is way off base. Like it's such a amazing message, grace. We're loved for free. There's nothing we need to do or can do to earn God's love. It's a gift. Like that is such a life-changing message. Like why on earth don't we know it and preach it? And that is the good news. So somehow us churches or church people, we kind of like don't trust grace or we don't think, ah, oh, I can't really be free. <laughs> There's gotta be, we have to commercialize it somehow and uh, control it. And, and then we slip away from grace and we get into meritocracy again. And you know what, and it's been helpful for me. Like I've had funerals over the years and uh, sometimes, you know, especially people who don't go to church, they wonder, am I good enough to have a church funeral? Um, and I never blessedly need to worry about it because it's not really about the person. It's not about how good the person was or what they did, or it's really about God's love. So I, I mean, after, for me, learning about grace, it was like, of course you're good enough. It really has nothing to do with you. <laughs> you're good enough because you're good enough in God's eyes or you're good enough for God because God just loves us as a gift. And uh, if we miss that, we miss the good news. We miss the gospel. So it's like, well, where do we go from there? And that gets kind of radical too. And Paul starts touching on that. If grace abounds, then people, can they just do whatever they want? And he goes, mm, yeah. But they won't, because when you know you're loved, don't worry, you're not going to go and be a really terrible person. You're going to go and do good works, but not because you have to, but because you want to, because you're loved first. Because you know grace, you're going to go and be gracious. That's kind of what Paul argues. And I've, I've talked to some people this week and raised the question. So in our in our world where we earn everything. And um, I talked to a young woman and she said that she uh, often when she's talking to older people, the criticism that older people have of the younger generation is they, they want everything. They don't want, they don't want to earn it. And they get these partic participation medals. Everybody gets a participation medal. They don't have to earn it. And, uh, and young people maybe want a house and they want a car and they don't earn it. Where the older generation, well, we earned everything. And don't, isn't that how it works? You earn everything. We live in a system of requirements. Like, I, I know when we talk of systemic injustice, systemic racism, systemic poverty, in many ways, we could also say we have systemic requirements. Like you just don't get things for free. Raises a question, and I can't really answer it myself, but it's worth talking about. What if we got everything for free? What if everybody got enough to live on from the time that they were a teenager and they didn't have to do anything? Would people just be lazy and would the world fall apart? And as, as someone said to me this week, it doesn't really work that way because like take seniors, for example, <laughs> seniors get paid to do nothing. <laughs> But seniors don't want to do nothing. Everybody wants to contribute to the world. Everybody wants to believe, not just believe, everybody wants to, com to contribute to their community and world and make a difference. And maybe the thing is we do what we, we want, not what we have to, or we would, there's some people that really want to contribute. They want to serve. They want to 
go fill sandbags just because they need sandbags filled. Some people might help each other because they want to do it, not because they get paid for it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk much more about that, but that's an interesting one to look at. There is a, a sense that grace is there and it's a gift and it's free. I want to say but. The trouble with a but is that it erases everything I just said. So maybe but's not the right word, but it's an and. And we need to accept the gift. We need to participate in grace. Um, I once heard the analogy used that air is for free. No one ever should pay for air. But we need to take a breath. I mean, at some point, air is free, but, it, but we need to take a breath. Now, I know another person would say, yeah, it's not even that. We don't actually take a breath. The universe breathes through us. No one can actually commit suicide by holding their breath. The deeper intelligence will take over and breathe for us. So it's not so much that even we breathe, but that the, the deeper intelligence that we are breathes for us. If we had to remember to breathe, we'd probably die within a few minutes because we forget, but blessedly um, we don't. But it could well be though that life is gracious, the universe is gracious, the world abounds in abundance, but somehow we have to participate by allowing it, by seeing it, by taking the gift, by letting go and letting God, by surrendering, by quit striving and struggling and working, we have to learn to be. And by learning to be, um, it's a way in which we, we take in the gift of grace. To quit our manipulating and stressing and trying and performing and role playing and all those things that are so unconscious for us um, and just live in grace. So in my last words, I'll just say, I think it's, this is so beautiful what the message is here about grace. Um, I think we all need to get a handle on it. Like if anybody said, so what's so great about religion or Christianity or Jesus? You say, well, it's grace. <laughs> grace can change the world. Grace is so beautiful. Do you want to live in a world of merit and performance and measuring up? Or do you want to live in a world where we're loved for free and it's a gift and it's grace? It changes how we live on this planet. It changes who we are. Um, so we can ask ourselves our own questions. Is Where does grace work in our life and where does merit work in our life? Do we think we have to earn everything or do we actually see that we, we receive things as a gift and we've received love as a gift and okayness as a gift and, and maybe ask ourselves how gracious are we <laughs> um, probably the more we live by grace the more we give grace the more we know we receive grace the more gracious we are the less judgmental and critical we are so great topic that Paul introduces for us today, the end of the system of requirements, performance, measuring up, and the beginning of living by grace. Thanks for listening to this message today. So we're going to ask Carolyn and Greg to sing, and I bet you all know what the next hymn is going to be. Amazing grace. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing grace. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet. Release.
So beautiful. Thank you, Caroline Gray. Irene Turner is going to lead us in our prayer time today. Thank you, Irene. You weren't muted. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close, remember those who have no options. May we who have had to cancel our trips, remember those who have no place to go. May we who have who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margins at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. And during this time, when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. The uncertainty and the real threat of the virus itself are producing fears and anxiety. Please support and encourage one another as we adapt to these circumstances. I encourage you to reread and pray Paul's confident assertion at the end of Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Irene. And our closing hymn, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing.
Thank you, you too. We close with these words, our benediction and our blessing. We are invited to live by grace, meaning to live as people who are loved for free. It is a gift, always given, always available. We begin our life in lo love. We begin each day, each moment in love. It is what we experience when we get out of our minds and into the depth of our being. Life is abundant. There is always enough. Our cups runneth over. Given and given, it will be given to you a full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. We can be gracious because we know grace. Because we know grace, we can be gracious. Let us be graced and be gracious. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.